welcome to Love Life, featuring your hosts, Rebecca Detman and Jane Donovan. The sun shines bright as it moves across my face. I feel the light. I acknowledge that during conflict, each person believes that they are justified. Welcome to Love Life. I'm Rebecca Detman. And I'm Jane Donovan. And today we are looking at conflict, not the really, really big conflicts which might go on and on and on or huge fights or big confrontations or anything of that nature, but rather the smaller little speed humps that just pop up in everyday life, sometimes between girlfriends, family members, the person you sit next to at the cubicle at work, the lady at the fish and chip shop, or wherever you know the path might happen to take you in the course of a day, the little things that put our noses out of joint, the little things that get a rise in us, the little things that bring up a strangely strong emotion about something or someone, which we might not actually quite understand what the motivation behind it is or where it's come from. Why do we have such strong feelings or resistance or reactions at times to something that a person might just say casually in conversation or something we might just observe or experience in the course of a day? And how the ripple effects of that can sometimes leave us feeling off kilter for three days later, like or a week later. And it's funny how how these these very very small things sometimes have the power to knock us right, sort of almost out of alignment if we don't keep a check on them. So we're going to explore this topic today, which is essentially about, I guess, um, really mastering our own vibration and energy, but also to do with really having a deeper level of understanding about what happens when two people have a little run in or a small conflict, a, uh, a difference of interest, difference of opinion, an energy clash. Beautiful intro, Beck. Nice. Thanks, Jane. Well, this has come about, this topic suggestion I put to Beck because recently I had a really unexpected altercation with somebody that I did not see coming and it completely confused me. It threw me. I went into overwhelmment, meltdown mode, serotonin being depleted, cortisol flooding, memory loss, the whole lot. And I never saw it coming. And, and that is kind of, I guess for me at this point in my life, is unusual. And so it threw me and it threw me for a couple of days. And so I wanted to dig into this because I went through the stage of the first situation, which is the victim story of I had my story, this guy had his story, and they were completely opposite. And I was so surprised because I was actually asking this person for help. And instead of me getting the support and help and advice that I thought I was going to be getting in this moment, what happened, some children came up to me and had an issue that I wasn't aware of. This man turned up and said, it's okay, it's taken care of. And then suddenly he turned on me and went at me. So I thought I had one problem that I was dealing with, but it became a whole second problem because it became a personal attack. So through that, I had to process what was going on. What was my role? What did I do to trigger him? What could I have done differently if I were to have this opportunity again? What was it I was really feeling? What was my true fear here? Why was I so emotional about this? And so I've been processing that over the last three days. And I thought this is a really important thing to talk about because I think every single walk, person walking this planet has this occur in their life, if not just occasionally every now and again. Some people have it happen every day or several times a day. So I thought that this would be good to talk through what I did to get to a place of peace with this conflict. And knowing our gorgeous Love Life listeners, you're probably all huge overthinkers just like me, and we spend far too much time analysing and thinking and considering and exploring things instead of getting on with being happy. However, it's what we do, so let's talk it through. So the first thing that I had to do was really look at my own fear. Why did I have such a strong emotional reaction to this person changing the course of the conversation to be about something different? And I had to really look at what was my fear. And my fear was very basic. The first fear of the conflict was that there actually was potentially some physical danger going on. And that's what I thought was being addressed. 
But the second fear was I was being misunderstood and I'm not used to that. I'm quite used to being well understood. And so I had to look at what was going on there. Actually, I think I'm doing too long a story here, Beck. We need you to come on in and share. The next step, though, was to own my behaviour. And there was, I did say something I wish I hadn't said. I understand it because that next stage is to forgive yourself. So I understand where that strong emotion came from and why I had such an inappropriate statement that I made that triggered the other person because I was in fear. And we have to remember that whenever we're in fear, and it doesn't matter whether it's fear for physical safety or whether it's emotional fear, is that fear induces two response, fight or flight. And I don't tend to run away. So I went into fight mode. Do you still class this as a small-scale conflict, though? Yeah, it was. Because it was just two people having a disagreement just verbally yeah, in, yeah, standing yeah, around. Yeah, 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 yeah. His energy was completely inappropriate in that it was definitely um, intimidation, uh, intimidation energy, which really I will go up against that because I think that's so wrong. And I did, after that initial moment, I was able to rein it in very quickly and be able to articulate myself much better. But it still wasn't getting anywhere. And there was no resolution to the conversation. And so I had to actually then go away and process after. Which there often isn't, is there? Well, that's the thing with these little things. It's As you did in the intro, you know, whether it's the, the checkout chick or it's the, the person in the chicken shop or the person that you you pay your parking fee to to park your car you don't get resolution and that's part of the problem for those of us that are sensitive and overthink things is that we then go away with residual energy and we've got to process it and because jane's an empath i mean see what she's able to do after an altercation like the one she had with this man is to drop into his energy and to see his side of the story or where he was coming from and what did you learn when you did that jane I learnt that he was in fear of embarrassment. He was feeling embarrassed. He was feeling embarrassed that the situation occurred in the first place. And, so, and yet I never held him responsible for that. That's the thing, isn't it? That's the thing. He made the assumption that I was holding him responsible when I wasn't. And here's what happened. When I went up and said, I'm going to swear, I said, what the F happened, that's what triggered him was that I used the F word. If I'd not used the F word, there wouldn't have been an altercation we'd discovered later. He thought you was coming to start a fight. He thought I was, and, and because he was already feeling embarrassed that the situation had occurred, he was taking on a responsibility that, in my opinion, he actually didn't have to take on. He had a reaction to me believing that my intent was to put it on him. So I think that when small conflicts happen, I think that there's two things at play. One is definitely what Jane's just illustrated, which is fear. Underlying most people's behaviours or thoughts in the negative light is some sort of personal fear. I'm scared that if this, then that will happen, or if I'm scared if she says that, or I do this, then that will happen, or I'm scared of being seen this way, or perceived this way, or treated this way, or this end result happening, right? But the second thing I think is quite simply classic communication breakdown. Well, we're, this would fall exactly into that category. Yeah, That's what it is. Where two people are coming from two often really different vantage points, but for whatever reason have not clearly enough expressed where they're coming from or what their platform is or why they're thinking or feeling the way they are. This is tied in with vulnerability, actually, because the less vulnerable we are in comfortably sharing what our experience of the situation is, the less information the other party has and the less that they know, the less they've got to work with to try and meet you in the middle and understand and compromise and make, make it up. So, you know, there'll often be those awkward little tussles between friends or an awkward email or a little nose put out of joint or something that was said at, you know, at Christmas to a family member that you wish you could retract because it was kind of in the heat of the moment when you're a bit stressed having just cooked the turkey and then someone came in the kitchen and said that thing that made you slam the fridge door and say that other thing back, you know, and then you sort of lie in bed till three in the morning worrying about, the, you know, but it's, it's usually this, this, this idea that if you would then perhaps turn around with the Christmas turkey and the sister or whoever in the kitchen and say, um, I'm really sorry that I just made that personal insult or whatever that remark was. The reason I did it 
is because I've been feeling really stressed, really tired and really worried about Uncle Bob and his failing health or something like that, or wh whatever the actual reason is. You know, very, very, very little in life do we actually ever be vulnerable enough to tell the real truth behind the way we're acting. Beautifully said, Beth, because this is exactly what I want this podcast to be about. Own what you're feeling, mm. identify it first, mm. know what it is, and then articulate it. So when I see this person again, I've now got great clarity yeah. of where my fear was, and I can explain that. And he likely will go, oh, my God, I so get that. Mm. It would be a very different world if rather than the minute we start to feel the energy of conflict or resistance of headbutting and, and a lot of people will really, well people will do two things in life from my observation. People are either pretty much fight or flight wired. So there are people who literally do not have a bone in their body that does confrontation. They will turn and run for the hills if there's any sort of uneasiness you know, in the air. They will avert their eyes, they will leave the room, they will turn off the computer, they will switch off their phone, they will literally not go there. Um, and then there's people who the warrior in them comes out and actually enjoys the fight and they will go to the next level and the next level and they'll up the ante and up the ante and they actually enjoy the thrill of it. Um, so, so you kind of, any time there's a, there's a conflict that, that pops up in life, you're pretty much going to get either one, I think, unless you've got someone who's just so zen balanced that they just very diplomatic, very measured, you know, they will um, mediate, they will talk it through, they'll make sure everyone is happy. And th those are lawyers. <laughs> or, you know, th those are, there are some people who just naturally have that gift of kind of diffusing the energy and the tension. So maybe there's three categories, should I say. Um, I think that's what all of our listeners are aspiring towards. And that's certainly what I know I, en would I say I enjoy it? I don't know if I enjoy it, but I definitely have it as a gift that if others are in conflict, I definitely have the ability to be able to help them with that. And do you do you have a belief, Jane? I heard you say this once years ago, something about if if two people are starting to get into a, a bit of a, what do we call it in Australia? A bit of a Barney conflict. <laughs> and there's a third person present, the responsibility almost falls on that person's shoulders to step in and adjudicate or make it easier or to... Do you think? Well, the fence sitter is an interesting one, isn't it? The fence sitter is not my favourite person in the world it's because it's enabling <laughs> and it's observing. It's like they've got no right to be there. They need to walk away if they're not going to participate. Right. Um, because often that fence sitter, we have Mrs Mangles from Neighbours, will then start becoming the town gossip. You know, they won't, it wasn't my, I wasn't involved, but I saw this and they'll be the one that will be sharing it with everybody, their interpretation of whatever went down. Either that or they're literally rooted to the spot frozen because they hate conflict. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to be there. I'm thinking, I'm picturing kids at home when mum and dad start arguing, you know, like what are the, like some people just freeze because yeah. they just feel yeah. so unpleasant in those energy environments. Those people though will be often, so while they're unable to perhaps contribute to help with resolution, what they will do is they'll be the, the gentle healers after. So after the conflict's finished, they'll be the one going, here, have a cup of tea or um, let me pour you a wine or it's okay, I just want to remind you you're beautiful. So they will contribute, but they contribute at a different time mm. and a different energy zone. Um, smooth out the ruffled feathers. That's it, yes. They won't go into the ruffles, but they will smooth out after. Mm. Um, but I think the most important thing is to understand that there is no conflict without fear. Mm. It doesn't exist. So you can't actually say, I'm not scared when you're arguing with someone. You are. And that's what I think is really important to own is that any time that you have raised your voice or having strong feelings or you've got strong body language going on or strong words, you are in fear of something. And if you can work out what that is, first off, you're going to have a beautiful signpost to yourself of how you can have further personal growth. And as you then identify with what that fear is and heal it, you've now got greater peace. And not only that, if, as Beck says, you're able to embrace your vulnerability and share that fear with the person you had conflict with, not to get them to agree with you, but to get them to understand you. And all we have to do is understand. That is huge. And that's almost the homework that I challenge the listeners to go away with this week is this idea that at any time in the next week, when you do feel you're not being understood or heard, or there's a conflict of any description, 
to really take your courage in your hands and actually say to that person exactly what you're truly feeling and thinking on the inside so that the misunderstanding does not continue and blow out and get worse. And I think you'll find if you, if you really speak from the truth, from the heart, really speak your personal truth, it'll really diffuse the situation in a very magical way. And I also think what Jane was saying just then is very important where she says, you know, you don't, you don't do this to expect an outcome. You don't do it to diffuse it or to get the person to understand you or to like get some kind of result where you win or anything like that. You just do it because to not speak your truth is like putting yourself in chains. It's, it's very important that your voice comes through loud and clear. It just, even if just for your own benefit, you know, that importance of just feeling that you have honoured yourself in making your position known. Now, what happens outside of that is not your responsibility or your business. People will take that and interpret that as they will and they'll respond and behave to that as they will. And that's fine because another part to conflict, Jane, I think if, you know, it's almost a bit of Abraham stuff really, but it's that whole not caring what people think as well. How does that tie into this? Very, very hard. Well, that's often what a lot of the fear is. In many situations of conflict, it is that you do care what the other person thinks. And so I had several fears going on. The first was, um, the first fear was initially safety for some children. The second th fear was I'm not feeling supported when I actually thought this person was going to support me. And then the third fear was that I think this person in his not supporting of me actually doesn't like me. And so that just says that I do care. So it's one thing to get to a very zen-like place where you actually really don't care what other people think of you. But I think that's a very difficult state to get to when you do care about people. And it's almost disconnected instead of connected. So while I think it's important to not give our power away to other people by allowing their opinions of us to shape us, I think it's okay to acknowledge that in a perfect world, we prefer people to like us than not like us. Not everybody is going to. But if a conflict has occurred with somebody that you know and you have a relationship with, then likely you do care that they like you. Now, with this particular person, it actually doesn't matter if he does choose to like me or not because it's actually a business arrangement we have. It's not a private, a, a social arrangement. But having said that, we do socialise and I think it would be nice if he did like me. And if I were to have the opportunity for another conversation, it would be to share. They are my vulnerabilities. Now, nobody feels horrible when somebody says, in a very simplest, most simplistic way, I want you to like me. That's actually a beautiful thing. It might be childlike, it might be immature, it might be unsophisticated, it might be vulnerable, it might be vulnerable where you don't have to be vulnerable. But it's actually a beautiful connective thing to say, I like you and I'd like you to like me. And that is so often our truth, and I know it is because I've just got tears in my eyes. Yeah. That, and this is the humane part of it because, you know, when I go into high schools and I talk to the kids about abusive relationships and like warning signs of abusers and, and I talk to them about what healthy relationships are, you know, with people and family and boyfriends and girlfriends and all that kind of thing. And one of the things I talk to them about is um, about the difference between when you're arguing or in conflict with someone in a healthy relationship and when you're doing it with someone in an unhealthy relationship. And in an unhealthy relationship, you've always got someone who wants to be right and wants to win and their needs always come first and yours are definitely second, if not seventh down the list, right? Whereas in a healthy relationship, even when people might be arguing or in conflict, they actually still do care about each other. And you, you can kind of tell that because even during the argument, they'll both sometimes still throw little little things out to sort of show that they're still... You know, they're not totally going to lose it or they're, they're, they're still, they're fueled by love. Often, often the disagreement or the conflict is, is coming from a place of wanting to help or do it better or get to a better place or whatever it is. And it's also indicative afterwards of how one recovers or how both of you recover from the argument, which is a really good indicator as to healthy or unhealthy, um, dynamics going on. Um, because people who genuinely are, as Jane's talking about, they do care. 
They do want to be liked. They want people to like them. It is important to them to stay connected to their community, their network, their friendships. Um, they will put in the effort afterwards. They will say sorry. They will do forgiveness work. They will then show how they're making it up to the other person or change their behaviours or do whatever it takes to try and reach that next level ground. You know, whereas the abuser or the, the person who just wants to antagonise or fight you is never going to provide a solution. They're, they'd rather keep fighting than actually resolve. Um, and they're going to make sure that you pay for it. Having said that, you know, if you do need to speak your truth to a person that is quite antagonistic, you can still do that because you don't have to make them wrong in explaining what it is you felt. So if we use this example, I could say to this man, I just wanted to share, I actually felt very embarrassed about our uh, altercation. And I did, I was deeply embarrassed because I like to think I've got better skills than that. So there was a lot of embarrassment. There was shame that was going on. But you weren't expecting and it. It was very like a surprise oh, attack. Oh, it came out of left wing. I didn't see it coming at all. And that's when you're not gathered together with all of your skills and your tools and no, your but, articulate. But, you know, thanks, Universe, for the opportunity. I actually did recognise that I actually, I actually did call on my tools and calm down relatively quickly. Um, within, a, within probably, I reckon, about five minutes, I was able to, I just did a couple of breath works. I reminded myself a little bit about my tools, my quickly called on the upstairs management, help me here. Um, I want this to go beautifully. I don't want it to be ugly and horrible. And so I, I did manage to do a better job quicker. But at the same time, I knew I could only last for a very short period of time because I could feel the serotonin depleting very, very, I could literally feel the hormones in my body shutting me down. However, by saying to this person, I felt embarrassed by our altercation. I felt ashamed. Um, I wanted you to know that I was in fear. Uh, my first fear was, you know, safety for children. My second fear was fear of not being supported. And my final fear was actually, I thought you liked me and I felt you didn't. And I just wanted you to know that it is my stuff and I wanted to share that with you. Now. What happens from that point is irrelevant. However, what I have done is actually stood up in a very sophisticated way. I didn't make him wrong in any way, shape of this. I just shared what I was feeling and what my fears were so that he knows that I am a thinking person that's able to be self-responsible. So he's kind of, now this, I'm not suggesting this person would continue to have lots of altercations with me. He likely wouldn't because we haven't before, so it's, it, it, it's unlikely. But if it was somebody that you would have reoccurring altercations, you have put them on notice though that you are a deep thinker and that you will be owning your part and that at some point they got to own theirs. Mm. They're not going to get away with it. And that's not really, if somebody is a, a perpetual antagonist, they actually don't want you as their target, so they'll actually, you do this once and they'll move on and find somebody else to pick on. But this podcast is more about that unexpected altercation with somebody that you do care about or you don't care about, but that leaves you with residual energy of what it is you can do. Now, the final thing I did, and I can do this because I'm an empath, but I actually think a lot of people can do this in their head anyway, is try and go into their side of the story. What is it? Just play the what if game. What is it that they possibly could be feeling? It doesn't matter if you never really know, but what could they possibly be feeling? And as you come up with a few scenarios of what they may be feeling, your empathy starts to reach out. And it helps to really diffuse. As soon as I went into his energy and got what was going on, there was nothing left of this. It's like, oh, is it that was all it was? Zero. Exactly. Completely zero. I could see it so clearly mm. of two, I'm going to say, beautiful people that had stuff going on. Exactly. And that's all it was. And I think that the final level of all of this is when you go away and you think about, why did this just happen? Why did the universe just show me this little test? Why did that strange thing happen last Thursday? I just can't get past it. It's back to the old social mirror and shadow work stuff as well. It's this idea that, well, just remember, everyone that we come up against in our reality is in some way holding up a little mirror to us to better highlight our own wounds, our own fears, our own insecurities, our own blocks. 
and any other stuck places or stuck emotions or energies that we might be holding. And we often don't know they're there until someone comes up and pokes their finger into it and wriggles it or puts lemon juice into it. You know what I mean? And so we can actually thank these people for continuing to be our teachers in showing us where, ah, there's still a part of resistance in me on that topic, or there's still a part of me that gets really nervous or anxious or insecure when somebody mentions that. Or, you know, and of course it's got nothing to do with the person who mentioned it or brought it up or stuck no. the finger in. It's your story stuff and to that end we say go back and listen to all the other episodes and do the shadow work do the release work do the social mirror work that they're looking at your own stuff and really taking ownership above all ownership that in a sense you could say the altercation that you may have just experienced had nothing to do with the other person at all it is purely and simply you having a resistance with some part of you that you have not come to peace with yet or understood at a deeper level and in closing for me, what I did doing exactly that back was that the final thing that I got was that while there were many layers to it, the deeper one that needs to, I need to continue to work on was that on some level, I still feel embarrassed and ashamed of my inability on occasions to control my emotions, which create an overwhelmed state within me as a HSP. So there's still more work to be done, which as we know, that always is. Yes. I acknowledge that during conflict, each person believes they are justified. Thank you for joining us today on our show and I'll run through all the usual places you can find us in case you've never heard me say any of this ever before and you're just thinking, <laughs> where do I find love life in this universe? Um, so you might find us through iTunes. You can join RSS feed and get it dropped into your inbox. You can join us on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash love life show. We are on YouTube. We are on kicks.com. We are on speakuptalkradio.com. Are we anywhere else, Jay? We are. We're in the universe. We're just, we're floating in the ether while you're sleeping, drilling your brain. <laughs> no, look, we're having a lot of fun doing this show. And if you want to keep feeding in the questions, um, usually the Facebook page is the best to do that with um, direct messages, but you can also go on the contact page of our website. And of course, our website's got all of our coaching and counselling services as well. So if there's something that you've been hearing us talk about and it's really ringing a bell for you, but you're just not quite sure how it applies to your indiv individual situation or not quite sure how to apply the tools to make it work for you that's where Jane and I can step in and we would love to assist so let us know and until this time next week have a lovely time I don't know if it's a lovely time but let's say have a useful and introspective time perhaps thinking over some of the more recent conflicts that you've encountered and perhaps looking at them through a light that you've never looked at them before with more ownership more mastery and more inner peace Life is perfect, I'm not trying, it's just happening And it's a beautiful day